Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Waters Church exists to see people's lives changed in the name of Jesus. And if you'd like to be a part of that life change that happens here every week, both in person and online, you can partner with us financially. Just go to waterschurch.org give and select the giving option that works best for you. Thanks again for joining us and we hope that you enjoy today's message. Dishonor is everywhere. We see it in our national discourse. We laugh about it in our entertainment. We express it towards our fellow man. And we see more and more of it growing in our families. But dishonor is not God's desire for any part of his creation. God honors those who honor him and calls his people to live with honor for others. Who are we to honor and why? Join us as we discover God's secret weapon for his people's success. Honor in the house. I'm very excited about this message series in particular. Honor in the house. And uh, today, we're going to kick this off six weeks. I believe you're going to be blessed by it. We're going to talk about the things God wants us to honor as his people. And uh, so two two, uh, passages of scripture we're going to go to. Usually we go to one. Today we're going to go to two. And we're going to go to first Mark chapter 6. And we will read that together in just a moment. Mark chapter 6. And we're also going to go to Revelation chapter 4. So Mark 6, Revelation 4. The title of the message today is, What Goes Up Must Come Down. What goes up must come down. So why are we doing a message series on honor? Here's why. It was in the video. I want to reiterate it again. Because dishonor is everywhere. Can anybody agree with that for a moment? I mean, it is everywhere. It's in our national discourse. It's in our families. It's in our marriages. It's in our um, universities. It's in our uh, perception of governmental authority, uh, even scriptural authority, even Uh, church authority, like everybody seems like compelled to voice their disgust everywhere, it seems, like never before. And I thought about this, we are such a dishonoring culture, it's almost like we take pleasure in knocking people down, uh, that I think about this, the church is constantly called to live counter to the culture in which it resides, counter to the way in which the world and non-believers do life. The church is a countercultural movement, a countercultural community. And I think that as the culture gets more dishonorable, it's time for the church to reflect more honor than ever before. Can I get a good amen for that? We want to be people who honor God, honor people, honor authority, and we want to honor marriage. We want to honor each other. This is a series I believe is going to be a blessing to your life. If you're taking notes, the first blank I want you to fill in there, there's a little phrase, I want you to get this in your mind. Honor is the currency of heaven. Honor is the currency of heaven. If you send it up, it will come down. This is the economy of honor. If you send honor up to God in your life, honor will come down into your life. Now, why is that important? Well, you've got to understand what the word honor means. And honor in the Hebrew, it's on your notes there in a little uh, definition, is kavod. Kavod. You see the definition says that it refers to weight or worth, value, heaviness, kavod. Like when we talk about honor, we're talking about who has the heaviness, the weight of a certain society, community, or group of people. For instance, you might look, you might go to a business and you might ask this question or you might go to a community, you might go to a family, you might ask this question, you might find this out through the discourse that you experience with those people that there is somebody in that organization, family, or group of people that carries the weight. 
You know what I'm saying? That phrase, who carries the weight around here? Or we find out, we say, oh, I see that they carry a lot of weight around here. What are we saying? They are honorable. They are honored in this community. The Greek word, the Greek word for honor in the New Testament is tima. Tima, to set a price on. It's economy, to value, to show high regard for. And here's what I think about God and honor and our responsibility to honor God. I want you to have this picture. In the ancient world, they would measure the worth of something by putting it on one side of the scale, and then they would put kavods, weights, on the other side of the scale. And so the more kavod had to go on to balance that scale, the more weightiness, the more honor, if you will, the more valuable that object was. And so you had to put kavod on one side to get balance in the scale. Here's why you're going to want to be a part of this series. Here's why you're going to not want to miss a message. Because many people today talk about how their life has no balance. They feel imbalanced in their emotions. They feel imbalanced in their family life. They feel balanced, imbalanced in their time, in their spirit. And we go everywhere and try almost everything to get balance into our lives. We're trying to get this sense of, I feel like the scales are balanced in my spirit, in my mind. In my, we're trying to get this. And so we'll go anywhere. We're almost like overdiagnosed in this culture. We get diagnoses coming out of our ears about what we need. And everybody has an expert opinion about what you need to put into your body or do to your body or mind or soul or spirit. It's like we're going everywhere except the source of our lives, our Father who is in heaven. And here's what I think. If you start putting some more glory and honor and weightiness into God's part of your life, into God himself, I believe you're going to experience supernatural balancing from heaven and your spirit will be well and your mind will be balanced and your life will be well and it shall go well with you in your life as you give honor and glory to the God who made you and formed you in Jesus Christ. I'm believing this for you. Get the honor right and watch the balance happen. Now, this is why the message is, what goes up must come down. Because God says in his word, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, check this verse out. Those who honor me, God says, I will, say it everybody, honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. What you're sending up to God will come back down to you in terms of honor. Now, I don't know about you, but I want God to honor my life. So, so think about the phrase again. Think about the definition again. To give weightiness, worth, and value to God means that he will then pour into your life weightiness and value and worth. What goes up must come down. And here's what I'm saying, Waters Church. I want our church to be a house of honor. As our culture gets more dishonorable, let the church shine the bright light of honor in our culture so that people can see you don't have to live hating everybody. You don't have to live despising everybody. You don't have to live being jealous and envious of everybody else in your life and trying to tear them down to make yourself feel better about you. No, you can honor everybody and watch God pour honor into your life because you know you're made in the image of an almighty God. I'm preaching now and I'm only five minutes in. Hallelujah. <laughs> what goes up? Come on, finish it. Must come down. Now, I want to talk to you about a passage in Mark chapter 6 where Jesus didn't get honor. And it was a shocking moment where Jesus did not get honor in the place where he should have gotten the most honor. So uh, stand with me as we read Mark chapter 6. Now, Here's a good question. Why do we stand for the reading of God's word? Honor. honor. Amen. You're right with me. That's right. We stand for the reading of God's word because we know that when I read this passage, when anybody reads this book, we are not hearing the thoughts and opinions of a man. We are hearing the thoughts and opinions of an almighty God. 
This is the living word of God. And, and I know it has its detractors, and I know some people disregard it, and I know for many Americans, it's a dusty old book grandma handed you before she died, and it sits on their shelves. But how many know when this book starts getting lived out and listened to, something supernatural starts happening in your life? So we stand for it because we are anticipating we're going to hear from God. Let him speak. And I want to just say one more thing since you're all standing. And, uh, and, and I like the fact that you're all cool with standing for the word of God. When someone says amen to the preaching, which, by the way, I like. <laughs> you, you have to understand that that person is not saying amen as in I do that and so should you people. Right? They're saying amen because they're saying, that's good, and I needed to hear that. All right, so if you're one of those people, like, you might not be used to an amen, clapping for the word kind of church, which we are, and I love, and I never want to stop being that kind of church, but you might be one of those people not used to it. You're like, hey, why are these people making so much noise? I can't pay attention. I can't pay attention. Listen, listen, relax. They're not trying to distract you. They're trying to put that word into them, saying to their spirit, amen, I needed that. Put that here so that I start living that out. All right, so let's get into the word of God. Here's what it says in verse one of Mark chapter six. He went away from there, and we'll talk about there, what there is in just a moment, and came to his hometown. This is Jesus, and so he's going to Nazareth, and his disciples followed him, and on the Sabbath, this is the day they went to church, he began to teach in the synagogue. The synagogue was their church, and many who heard him preaching were astonished, and they said, where did this man get these things? Jesus was a fabulous teacher. Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? And look at the next verse. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And they took offense at him. Now, they take offense, but here's, what, here's how Jesus describes their response. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without, say the word, everybody, honor. honor. So they take offense. Jesus says, no, you're, you're not honoring me. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. In other words, the only place a prophet won't be listened to and regarded as honorable is where he grew up. And among his relatives and in his own household. And then this tragic verse in the Bible. And he could do no mighty work there. He could do no mighty work there. Why? Because they dishonored him. They had no respect and reverence for Jesus. Except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That's an amazing thing. He still, I'll heal a couple of sick people. And then look at this. And he marveled. Somebody say marveled. marveled. The reason why I say, say marveled is because this is one of the two times, only two times in the entire Bible, Jesus gets shocked. How many know it's hard to shock the Son of God? <laughs> and, and here it is, one of the parts where he's shocked. He's like, I can't believe, he said, it, he marveled because of their unbelief. And then don't miss the last part of verse 6. We're not going to talk about it later, so I want to talk about it now. And he went out. And he went out among the villages teaching. Let me, just, let me just talk about that last line. Here's what happened. He went to church in his hometown. He preached. They dishonored him. They neglected to listen to him and pay him the honor and reverence that he was due. And guess what he decided to do? Go to the streets. May it never be in this church that we get so comfy and cozy with Christianity and the presence of God when we gather in this building that we start dishonoring the gathering of God's people. And, and because of that, the Holy Spirit says, if you won't honor me in this building, I'll go out of this building and I'll reach people in the streets because he'll do that if he has to. I want the Holy Spirit to go out to the streets, but I want him to go in our bodies because we've been filled up on Sunday and we're bringing it out Monday through Saturday everywhere we're going. May it never be that we lose honor for Jesus in this house. Can I get a good amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you be honored in this next few moments. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. May we see Jesus. May Waters Church be known as a place where the Lord is honored. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Point number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus is worthy of honor. 
Jesus is worthy of honor. When we gather in this place, we gather in the presence of Jesus. When we gather here in this room, I know it's a building, in a location, geographic location, understand that, but here's what you need to know. If you're a Christian, the scriptures are clear, you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's a big deal. You're a child of God. That's also a big deal. You're an heir of God. That means you've got an inheritance coming to you through Jesus Christ. And guess what else the Bible tells us, the scriptures teach us? That we are the body of Christ. When we gather with each other in this room, we're not gathering with a bunch of nobodies. We're gathering with the living, breathing body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us are hands. Some of us are feet. Some of us are ribs. I don't know. I'm a mouth. <laughs> I'm a big mouth. Ah! Right? You know, there's a body of Christ here. This is the body of Christ. When we gather as the church, we gather in the presence of Jesus spiritually. Yes, spiritually, but also physically with each other. So here's what I want you to do for one second. Don't do this with me or with someone that you came with, but I want you to take a look at someone else in this building, sitting in this area right here. Just three seconds. Go ahead. Look at someone else. Everybody, look at somebody else. Look at someone else. Quick, quick, quick. Everybody now. Don't look at me. Okay, stop because it's getting weird. Okay. You know what you just looked at? You looked at the presence of Jesus. See, the Bible tells us this in 1 John. As he is, so we are in this world. When the world looks at the church, the world will see Jesus. And so that means that when I gather in this room with you, I don't gather with nobodies. I don't gather with anybody who's insignificant. I gather with someone filled with the Holy Spirit, an heir of God, made in the image of God, called out of darkness into his marvelous light to declare his praises. I'm gathered with some pretty heavy and significant people in this room. You matter to God. And, and where Jesus is, Jesus is, there's there should be honor there. We want to honor each other. And in honoring each other, we honor Christ. Next week, by the way, we're, going to talk, we're talking about honoring God today. But next week, we're talking about honoring everybody. And that's Memorial Day weekend, or as some preachers like to call it, National Skip Church Weekend. <laughs> Don't skip. You come on back. You got all weekend to barbecue. Come and give God an hour and a half. Let's Talk about how we can honor everybody. Don't miss Memorial Day weekend here at Water Church. We got nine baptisms, by the way, lined up for next weekend. Awesome. Here's how I want you to see it. Nine new members of the body of Christ. So Revelation chapter 4 says, Worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. Now, here's why I bring up Revelation. Because Revelation... The word revelation, we, we get so caught up about revelation. We want to know about the end times. We want to know about when is Jesus coming back and who's the dictator beast and who's the antichrist and why is there a dragon sitting waiting to eat a pregnant lady's baby and all this kind of stuff. It's in the book of the Revelation. If you've, never, um, if you've never been freaked out, read Revelation. You will be officially freaked out. And we've spent a lion's share of our time with Revelation trying to figure out the dates and the who's and the what's of the end times. And here we do a lot of times with Revelation. We say, who's the Antichrist? Let's figure out who's the Antichrist. And we're always trying to find a world leader. I'm sure it's Saddam Hussein. I'm sure it's Osama bin Laden. I'm sure it's, remember this one. Some of you remember this way back in the day. It's Ronald Wilson Reagan. How many remember? for this speculation because he had Ronald, six letters, Wilson, six letters, Reagan, six letters, 666, the Antichrist. Right? This, this is what we did. We were so bored in church back then, we would tell our presidents, sorry, we believe you're the Antichrist. And, um, and this was a <laughs> big mistake when it came to the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation is a revelation not of the Antichrist, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
See, the, the, the book of Revelation is the apocalypse. The Greek word is apocalypse. It's the unveiling. The word, the word apocalypse means pulling the curtain away so that we see Jesus. Now, there's some crazy stuff that goes down in Revelation. I want to read a passage, a little, a little bit of crazy for you, because it's really incredible what happens in Revelation. Because I want to just give you context for the passage that I just read here in Revelation chapter 4. I want to give you the context of where that happens. It's an amazing context. Here's what it says. In verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, After this I looked and behold a, a door standing open in heaven, and the voice spoke to me saying, Come up here. John says, I was invited into heaven. Now how many of us would like to be invited into heaven for a peek? <laughs> like I'm having a rough day, God. Could I just get a peek? And John gets a peek at heaven. And here's what it says. And it says, uh, at once, John says, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. That's Jesus. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow and an appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. Like this is a throne surrounded by thrones. And on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments, golden crowns on their head. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it was, a sea of glass like crystal. And then skipping down to verse uh, 8, it says this, And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes around and within, and day and night they never, day and night they never cease to say, this is what's happening in heaven, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it goes on, and whenever the living creatures do that, whenever they give glory and honor and thanks to him who, who, seated on, who is seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy, here's the verse that's on the screen now, worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. What a glimpse of heaven. I would love that glimpse. And here's what you need to see about heaven. In heaven, Jesus never stops getting worshipped and honored. So I want you to fill this in in your, in your notes because this is going to matter for you in just one moment. Heaven is where Jesus gets honor. And where Jesus is honored is heaven. What happens in heaven? Jesus gets honored. Where is heaven? Wherever Jesus gets honored. Here's why that matters for you. You're going to love this. Just one second. Here we go. Many of you are facing hell in your life right now. In your marriage, you've got hell. In your kids, hell. In your job, hell. In your body, maybe cancer, maybe diagnosed something. Hell is going. Maybe you're addicted to something. You just feel like you're going through hell. You have an opportunity to bring a touch of heaven into that hell. How? Honor Jesus in that place. <laughs> Honor Jesus in your family. Honor Jesus in your body. Like, let me just say something to the single people. I know that one of the hardest things to do is to stay sexually pure before you get married. But you realize it's also the most protective thing that you can do for your life. You don't know where that dude has been, young lady. You don't know. You, you don't know what diseases might await your body. Let me put it like this. You don't know what hell awaits your body when you treat it like a jungle gym sexually. You don't know what, what hell awaits your finances when you don't listen to God's word and honor God financially. And you think, no, I'll just do whatever I want. And you get hell. And you think, well, what's happening? Here's the deal. I'm telling you, this is the currency of heaven. If you want heaven invading your life, start honoring Jesus with every facet of your life. Good things are going to come because what goes up, come on, must come down. Do 
this is for your good. And where Jesus gets honor is heaven. Because that's what's happening in heaven where Jesus is all the time. Number two, in your notes. The presence of Jesus is an opportunity to show him honor. So Mark chapter 6 opens with, and he went from there and he came to his hometown. So what's the there? Where did he come from? Okay, Mark is showing us, he's building a case for the disgraceful thing that happens in Nazareth. And here's how he builds the case. Because you've got to kind of read this chapter in context of Mark's gospel. So Mark chapter 1, he's baptized. Uh, Mark chapter 2, he picks his disciples. Mark chapter 3, he calms the sea. And the storm and the disciples, the wind and the waves obey this man. Mark chapter 4, he cast demons out of a man who had been demonically oppressed. So much so, nobody could hold him. Nobody could restrain him. He broke, he broke out of jail. He lived wild in the wilderness. And he was a crazy man. He sees Jesus. He falls to his feet. And Jesus says to the demons that are inside of him, get out of this man. And he becomes completely sane and whole and becomes a witness for Jesus for the rest of his life. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus raises a dead girl from the grave. It's the daughter of a synagogue ruler, a pastor, a local pastor. Jesus raises her from the grave and everybody is like, who is this man? Nothing can't obey his voice. Whatever he says happens. And then on the wave of this amazing reputation. He goes home to Nazareth. Who goes to Nazareth? Nazareth was a no-name town, a loser town, a town nobody planned on moving to. You moved out of Nazareth. Who goes to Nazareth? Jesus goes to Nazareth because God loves the lonely and the lowly people of our community. What an, and here's what I want you to see. What an opportunity to have Jesus come to your hometown. You, you realize it's an opportunity. When we show up in this church and we worship Jesus, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to see him do amazing things in our midst. How are we gonna see him do amazing things in our midst? By showing him honor. I, I want you to know the English definition of the word honor is high respect or esteem. And I only share that definition to ask you this question. It's in your notes. Who do we respect? Three E's on purpose. Because I'm going to answer that question with three E words. Here's who you respect. R E E S P E C T. Find out what it means to <laughs> He. Number one is we respect the person who has our ear. In other words, who do you listen to? And when they say it, you believe it. Like 10 other people could tell you it, and you're like, mm, not sure. But they say it, and you're like, it's true. I hope that for every Christian in the room, this has the final say of your life. This has the final say. So when culture says A, and God says B, we go with B. So when the Republicans say A and God says B, we say, no, 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 B. When the Democrats say A and God says B, we say, no, 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 B. Amen. He has our, what? Amen. Ear, we listen to him. Number two, we respect the person that we emulate. Who do you want to be like? That's who you respect. Here's another way of thinking about that. Who do you least want to be like? That's the person you least respect. And then number three, we respect the person that we do extra for. Who do we do extra for? That's who we respect. Here's what happens as a Christian. When you first come to Jesus, how, how many know everything changes? Your heart is lifted. Your burdens seem to fall away. Your light, you got vision for your life. You've, you feel accepted by God. You're just in love with the reality that Jesus saved you. You're now a Christian. It's a beautiful thing. You, you wonder why no one else, all the other people who aren't Christian, you wonder why aren't they Christian? You can't help tell people. You got to come to my church. You got to know Jesus. It's amazing. And, and you're just so excited. And when you first get saved, how many know you're excited to come to church? 
We can't wait to get here. You come and you sit in the front row. You come to the front because you know that sometimes the Holy Spirit only goes three rows deep. Come on, somebody. You're so excited to be here. You love, oh, I want to be in the house of God. I was glad when they said to me, let me go to the house of God. A be- better is one day in your course than a thousand days anywhere else. I'm excited to be with Jesus. And, and you can't help but share it and tell it. You respect God most of all. But if we're honest, that tendency of the human heart to fade and we start doing less and less and less. And I'm challenging to, to get back on the honor train and get back to those. Remember what God, Jesus says to Ephesians in Revelation 3. He says, hey, keep, go back and do the things you were doing in the beginning when I first met Go back and do that again. And, and, and I think about it like it's like the 10-year marriage. You want to you guarantee your marriage last 10 years? Here's the plan. <laughs> Year one, wife starts coughing. Husband says, honey, I'm going to drive you to the hospital. I'm going to make sure you're all settled in. Then I'm going to go home, do laundry, cook, clean, make sure everything's all set at home for you. Then I'm going to go get you, bring you back, put you in the bed. I'll sleep on the couch. You have the whole bed to yourself. I want you to get better. Year three, the wife gets a cough. Honey, I'm going to drive down to the pharmacy. I'm going to get you some cough medicine. I'm going to come back for you. I'll make you a nice dinner so you can get some rest. Year five, the wife gets a cough. Honey, why don't you drive yourself down to the pharmacy? Get yourself some cough medicine. Come on back. Take care of that nasty cough. Year eight, the wife, stops, the wife starts coughing. Honey, can you keep it down? I'm trying to watch the game. Come on. That's the 10-year marriage plan right there. You, you know, this is what I'm saying about Christians, though. We, we start a blaze, but if we're not careful... We'll cool off. I don't want you to cool off. I don't want us to cool off as a church. I never want us to get to the point where where we feel like we've arrived, we've made it, that's it. That's why we always have a building plan. That's why we're always raising money. That's why we're always asking to come early, sit in the front. How about this? How about instead of saying, well, it's Sunday, I don't need to rush out the door. How about to say, no, wait, this is the Lord's day. This is the day I get to go to church with my family. Let's get up early. Let's get out of the house. Let's get to church on time because God is worthy of our honor. Like, I don't know where you get the verse that says that the singing is the pregame show and you don't really have to worry about that until the preaching starts. I don't see that in the verse. I don't see that in the Bible anymore. Like, I don't know, you know, some of you too, it's like, this is what you do because you, know you know the liturgy around here. You know the pattern of service. And so, you know, the hand raised moment, then he's going to pray, everybody's going to clap. And when everybody claps, that's our signal. Let's get the heck out before anybody sees. Let's get our kids out first so we can get to our car first, so we can get to Chili's as quick as possible. And it's like, hey, wait a second, wait a second. Does Chili's get more honor than Jesus? I think not. I think we should wait until the singing is over and the service is completed because we know our God is worthy of honor. He gets the glory in our life. You know, some of you, like, we ask you to move to the middle of the section because we've got this wide section. We want to make room for people on the outside. And, and how about we say, wait a second, that's, that person who's going to come in after me is honorable because they're the body of Christ. So when the usher asks me to move in, I don't go. And I want to sit where I want to sit. Like, how about we don't do that? How about we say, wait, no, I will make room for the other people who are coming because Jesus is in that person and he's worthy of my honor. Less and less clapping as I continue with this pattern of preaching. Let me continue. <laughs> like, I, I, just personally, how about waking up early, hitting the floor with your knees first? You want to turn on the television first? Why? What has that done for you? (laughs) Except make you jealous and hateful and spiteful and, you know, lustful and all that kind of stuff. Why? Uh, First, knees. Hit the floor. Jesus, this is your day. You made it. I didn't. You invented it. I didn't. I'm here because of you. You're not here because of me. 
Help me to live with honor for you today. How about uh, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10? I love this one. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Every paycheck, you get a test from God. Who gets the first out of that paycheck? He says, honor him with the wealth, with the first fruits of your increase, of your produce. So here's the test. God says, payday, who are you going to pay first? Who are you going to give your firsts to? Some of you, it's the mortgage company. Some of you, it's the electric company. Some of you, it's your kids. I've talked to people. I can't, they say, I can't tithe. We can't afford it. And I always know why. Because you worship at the altar of your children and you buy them everything that they want and you never say no because you're scared of their disapproval of you. Your God is whoever you fear disappointing the most. You understand this? And some people, I can't tithe because, and they pay, they spend inordinate amounts of money on everything else except the kingdom of God. We want to put God first in our wealth. And then it says this, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be burst into wine. Here's why you don't want to put anybody else first financially because nobody else can bless you. Nobody else can prosper you. Nobody else can pour into you and control the circumstances around you to make it go well with you. The mortgage company can't do that. The electric company can't do that. And Verizon can't do that. Jesus can do that. And online watchers, too, this is for you. Don't skip this part of the message. Don't go get yourself something to drink right now. You stay right where you are because this is for you. You need to honor God financially if you're watching online. There's a button to give. Click it now. Come back in Jesus' name. (laughs) So we have an opportunity, though, for everybody here to honor God financially. And uh, we're starting two new campuses in September, praise Jesus, Milford, Woonsocket. I know we're excited. We're going to do on Father's Day, part of this series, Father's Day weekend, First Fruits Offering. We're, we're believing God for $300,000 by the end of summer to buy the equipment we need to get these campuses up and running. We do not want to have half-hearted churches in those, in those cities. We want to do great and, and wonderful things for the community. It takes money. If you're excited, I'm going to ask you to start praying and asking God, what should I give in that first fruits offering? And what then after that? Here's an opportunity to honor God financially and watch God pour into your life financially. If you do, I'm just saying, does God carry the weight in your wallet or does, does other things? And so it's time. It's time. Here's an opportunity. Give God the first fruits. Number three, honor presents an opportunity to move further with God. So Mark chapter 3, it says that they took offense at him. And he says, now you're, no, you're, you're dishonoring me. You're belittling me. They're like, oh, this is Jesus. I remember Jesus when he was 16 years old. He was a funny looking kid down the street, lived with Mary and Joseph. I remember that kid. And familiarity breeds contempt. You know what America's problem is spiritually right now? You know what America's problem is spiritually right now? Jesus is as American as apple pie. And and, and we've gotten so familiar. We're like, oh, yeah, that's just Christianity. Oh, oh, yeah. And we have forgotten how Christianity made this country the country that it is. Just do some real research. Like, don't learn this from state-funded institutions. Like, go into real history books and learn how the Great Awakenings shaped this country to put an end to slavery. You got got to do that. The the first Great Awakening fed the seeds to make this country break away from England. The second Great Awakening fed this country the spiritual life to abolish slavery. You got to do real research. Because what you're getting from everybody else is Christianity's the problem, Islam's wonderful, let's invite all the Muslims over. Yeah. And I'm not against having Muslims come to this country. Come on in so we can tell you about Jesus. But let's stop saying Christianity is the problem. Christianity is the biggest blessing this world has ever seen. 
That's the power of the name of Jesus. I know it's got its faults. I know you've been hurt by the church. I know the church has got some bad centuries to its name. But over the course of 2,000 years, the world is better wherever Christianity is proclaimed freely from the pulpits of churches in that nation. And so we are familiar with Jesus, too familiar. And so this is what's the problem here. And, 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 and the Bible says that they took offense at him because they were too familiar with him. And I love how the message translation says it. The message translation says they tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling. And they never got any, what? I don't want that to be my story. Verse 5, it says that he could do no mighty works there. I said it. Tragic verse. So I thought about, like, this is in heaven waiting for all of you. The record, the record of mighty works that Jesus performed in your life that you'll be able to look at when you get to heaven. Look at all the things. Like, let's just say, this is the real estate of the mighty works in my life because of Jesus. But I wonder if we dishonor him, how many of us, we're going to get to heaven and we're going to see something tragic. That's actually what you experienced on earth. And this is what you could have had on earth. And the only difference is honor. Just honor him. And watch the mighty works happen. I want this church to experience cancer being healed. In Jesus' name. Mighty works. Families reunited. Lost children brought home. People on medication for everything freed through the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus. I want addictions broken in this church. All these mighty words. And by the way, these things already start, these things already are happening. How do they happen more? What goes up? Must come down. Honor sets the church ablaze for the mighty works of Jesus. Question in your notes is this. What might I be missing by dismissing the opportunity to honor Jesus? What might I be missing by dismissing the opportunity? I come to church late. I leave early. I go if I feel like it. I go if the weather's just right. I go only when it's convenient. What might I be missing by dismissing the opportunity to honor Jesus. What financial miracles might you be, might you be missing because you're, you're dismissing the opportunity to put God first financially? And finally, number four, and this is a big one, honor for God is an act of faith. It takes faith to honor God. It takes faith to do things differently because what Jesus says to do, you do. How, how many know it takes faith to forgive some people? It takes faith to say, I know you hurt me, but I'm not going to hold it against you for the rest of your life. See, it takes no faith to hold on to grudges and hurts and pains of your past. It takes great faith to understand. I believe that God will set every record straight and balance every scale even. And because of that, I can forgive you. I know I've done terrible things myself. I forgive you. He marveled at their unbelief because they didn't honor him. My Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God for those who would draw near to God, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. But what does it mean to earnestly seek him so that we can get those rewards? What does it mean to earnestly seek him? It means you honor him in your life. He gets the weight. He gets the weight of your life in every area. I'm going to do parenting the way God says. I'm going to do marriage the way God says. I'm going to do singleness the way God says. And I know it's difficult. That's the faith part. That's the faith part. How many know it was difficult for Noah to be building that boat for 150 stinking years? Well, everybody else is like, what are you doing? 
And, and some of you, that's your life. What are you, why? Why is church such a big deal? Why is Jesus, I mean, just have your private little faith thing and, you know, be like everybody else. No, I'm a child of the king. I'm royalty, baby. I'm anointed and appointed to great things. And I'm going to put him first and give him the weight of my life. I'm asking you, send the honor up and watch it come down. Would you stand with me? Bow your heads and close your eyes. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, that we will be a church that honors you and honors you in our homes and honors you in our money and honors you in our time and honors you in this house that we will respect you. Oh God, help us to stop taking lightly these wonderful things that we experience in your presence. That every time we enter into this room, we could experience a miracle. Thank you, Jesus.